What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Talk of the Tundra, your Green Bay Packers podcast that is a proud partner of the Eurostep Podcast Network and the Blue Wire family. Uh, as always, I am your host, Numac, joining you for, I guess, coming to you, rather, with the post-NFL draft recap of the all the players the Packers picked in the 2024 NFL draft. And to break down rounds two through seven with me is my lovely co-host, Jordan Tresky. Jordan, how are you doing, buddy? Doing well. We're back. We're here to talk about the draft. We're here to talk about the pack with new Mac. You keep doing the new Mac, and it's it's making it's tickling my fancy. So to as they say. to peel the curtain back on my name for people, I oftentimes switch between new Mac and new Mac, because like sometimes I forget myself how it's pronounced. It kind of depends on the day if I do like the shortened day or the long day. So. The more you know. But the Packers have 11 new uh, rookies on their team after this past weekend's draft. Obviously, we talked about offensive tackle Jordan Morgan um, in our pod that was released on Friday. So you haven't checked out that, go check out that. Um, but we're here to talk about the rest of the picks through picks, or I guess the number 45 pick that was picked on Friday, all the way through pick 255 uh, late saturday afternoon so with that being said i guess jordan do you want to briefly go over all the picks start with jordan morgan quickly and then move on to the rest of them yes let's do it this is the full rundown of the green bay packers 2024 draft class so jordan morgan first round pick number 25 overall for uh, off the tackle from arizona um, second round pick, number 45 overall, linebacker Edrin Cooper from Texas A&M. Second round pick, number 58th overall, safety Javon Bouillard from Georgia. Bouillard? I think it's, I think it's Bullard. Cause Bullard? It, yeah. Because I said Bouillard yeah. and Keith made fun of me. <laughs> See, I look at that like Bouillon. That's, like a, Bouillon. that's what I thought, but there's no O in it, which is kind of why I think it's just Bullard. Bullard. Never mind the Bullards. There is anyway, no third... pronunciation thing on the beast. I checked. Uh okay, that's okay. That was gonna be my next uh next move. Anyway, uh to continue this order, third round, number eighty eighth overall, running back Marshawn Lloyd from USC, previously a U the University of South Carolina, which will make me laugh because he went from one USC to the next USC, uh the more prestigious USC. Anyway. Third round, nor, uh, number 91, uh, linebacker Tyron Hopper from Missouri. The pick that came to the Packers in the Brazil Douglas trade, if everybody remembers correctly. Um, fourth round pick, now we're on to day three. Fourth round pick, number 111th overall pick, safety Evan Williams from Oregon. Uh, the Packers trade up with the Jets for that one. Uh, fifth rounder, number 163rd overall. Interior offensive lineman Jacob Monk from Duke. Packers trade up with the Bills for 168 and 219. I should have included the picks that the Packers used or traded with the Jets. but um, Notably, that pick 168 came from uh, the Saints after they moved back from pick 41 in the second round to get Edron Cooper. Yes. There that, we go. But they had 219 initially and then traded up to 163 from 168 thanks to that trade back earlier. Uh, fifth round pick, number 169th overall pick, safety Katan Oladapo from Oregon State. A compensation pick, it should be noted. Sixth round, number 202nd uh, overall pick, interior offensive lineman uh, Travis Glover from Georgia State. Seventh round pick, number 245th overall pick, quarterback Michael Pratt from Tulane, ride the big green wave. And seventh round pick, number 255th overall pick, cornerback Kalen King from Penn State, also a compensation pick. I believe third to last pick in the entire draft. Correct. That is your Packers draft class. That is the 2024 draft class. So um, I think we should go through, I guess, the, at least the, fir- the top 100 picks, the first five picks they made, and talk about each of those guys briefly and then we'll get into some reaction as to their their draft strategy as well as um just the themes overall so let's start with jordan morgan quickly um as we mentioned on friday in 
in that initial pod from the first round of the draft. Uh, offense, offensive tackle from the University of Arizona had an 84.2 PFF passing grade in 2022 and 87.1 passing uh, block grade, pass blocking grade in 2023. Uh, was a little worse uh, for wear in run blocking. 78.6 and 77 were his grades from 22 to 23. He was planning on coming out for the 2023 draft until he suffered a late season ACL tear in the 2022 season. So that meant most of his uh, time this the that in that offseason and getting back to form this year was spent um, preparing for the 2024 draft all of 2023. 98% of his snaps came uh, in college came at left tackle and he allowed just over or just three sacks over. 920 pass uh, blocking snaps in his last two seasons, which is pretty darn good, I'd say. Pretty darn good. Um, 9.24 RES, still pretty good athletic um, tackle. Obviously, the not I guess Twitter darling of Graham Barton had one of like the most elite uh, RES postings, relative athletic scores. I keep saying RES scores, even though that's kind of like RBI for trying to be redundant um, at like 9.99, but still a very good athlete for uh, Jordan Morgan is for uh, J- Jordan Reed of ESPN uh, asked Jordan Morgan, what considers what contender helped themselves the most. I'm sorry. My apologies. Jordan Reed of ESPN when asked what contender helped themselves the most quote, the Green Bay Packers after the Packers really saved Bakhtiari this off season, there was a need for depth at offensive tackle Viewed by some scouts as a guard, Arizona's George Morgan brings the versatility and the, has potential to be, to be a plug-and-play option at left tackle. It was great to see Green Bay take its first offensive tackle in the first round since 2011. So, I guess, any other thoughts from you, Jordan? I know pre-pod, you had said you were feeling better about the George Morgan pick uh, in the days since uh, we recorded. I have been. I think part of it is the shock of you get you target a, a prospect. Cooper DeGene was certainly on the minds of mine, Numox, everybody in Green Bay. Surely there Wisconsin. wasn't a disappointed uh, co host <laughs> on, <laughs> on Thursday. But it, I mean, I think part of it is that you get it's just way more easier to just be like, I want to talk myself into a position of. The, it just pops out on screen more. They're going to be disruptive players if it's a secondary player or if it's, you know, someone that's finishing plays as a linebacker. Like, it's – this is what it is with when it comes to offensive linemen. They're not – they're – the last people mentioned, they service other players. You know what I mean? Their whole need is to protect the quarterback, fill in running lanes for the running back, or – why receiver depending on what the play is like it's so dis <laughs> very different to any other player on the field at all times really and it's easier just to get yourself caught into other guys but with jordan moria i think a lot of it is just reading more of like his evaluation obviously it helps seeing the full breadth of the class and just kind of how I just feel like outside of, I mean, the obvious is the six quarterbacks going in the 12, first 12 picks, that blew everybody out of the water, especially with, you know, the the last few of those quarterbacks in that top 12. Then you just kind of have like, okay, here's the next run of guys. Here's the positions that we thought were going to be of value earlier in the draft. Well, they go later, like the corners. Like the first cornerback was Quinton Mitchell taking at 22. That was far later than what he was getting buzzed at as the whole draft process went on, and he's yeah. rising up based on senior. Bowl. You know what I mean, yeah, the he more was like information, twelve or thirteen at some point. And this is the thing: is that the more information that we get regarding the draft, especially when the season is over, you get talked into. Oh, the buzz is buzz is building, buzz is building, buzz is building. And really, what happens is when it comes back to draft night, it's that the original draft of the evaluations by and large, stick to what they were before that point. Unless if it's a guy that just really wows or really, I don't know. There's obviously outliers in that. And it's 
my God, there's 257 guys picked in the draft. So, of course, there's going to be some guys that don't fit the mold or whatever the case may be. My long-winded answer to, to finally answer your question is, reading more about Jordan Morgan, especially seeing how the Packers view him, one, that he's a left tackle. I know the draft, there's been a, it's Dane Brugler, Jordan Reed right there. He kind of mentioned guard. He's got to be a left tackle. It helps that he can play other positions, but his value to the Green Bay Packers at the position that he would, or the little pick position that he was selected at is a value to them because he's going to be their starting left tackle if all goes to plan. And the fact that I believe two teams are on record as to wanting Jordan Morgan, uh, the Washington Commanders, Jerry Jones let it spill that the Cowboys were hoping that he would be available when they traded back for um, from the 24th pick to the 29th pick. He, the the Dane Brugler's evaluation or like grade of that first round, second round, basically let, late first round is kind of the start of his range. By and large, was correct. Yeah, you know I mean, like those teams really wanted him back half of that of day one, and you know, try to pry him from where they were. And I, I don't fault Goody for taking where he was, given the fact that if they had tried to kind of maneuver some trade back scenario, they probably wouldn't have gotten him if it was even if it was day one too. So I think mo- knowing more information and how other teams valued him or saw him with their his draft stack kind of at least, you know, reassured me with where the Packers see him at, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. And I think, like, what you talked about with um, people speculating, like like Dane Brugler, that he best uh, slots in as guard, given his build. But Brian Gunnikun said as much that they're, they're going to probably play my tackle. This is from uh, Goody. Quote, we've had a bunch of guys that have played outside there with not, I guess, prototypical arm length and been fine. I think what makes up for it usually is their feet and athleticism. That's what Jordan has, and end quote. So yeah, I think without a doubt they're gonna stick him out there, and he will have an, all the opportunity in the world to beat out Rashid Walker for that spot. And I and I don't think it'll be dissimilar to how Rashid Walker and Yash Naiman operate at left tackle this year, where it'll be a platoon in some drives or most games going on and off some drives, two drives on, two drives off kind of thing, and then come the middle of this middle of the season we'll see who really beats out um the other for that for that spot and becomes a starting left tackle for the franchise um yeah i i haven't like changed my opinion so much on it like i think it's a it's good hopefully he works out i'm not saying he is not going to but i just i'm all the best with jordan morgan is like basically what i'm what i'm trying to say here um i was obviously uh pining for cooper de Jean or Khalid mckinstry draft night stuff like that but um like you said off- offensive tackle is not a sexy pick i think that's evidenced by chargers fans like literally booing the joel alt pick it's like <laughs> you you just needed another tackle on that on that line to help out justin herbert and that's a great pick like you don't need to pick a star there you pick something that's good for the team and that's what joel alt was for the chargers and i think this, that's the same thing of what it was for for the packers shore up the line get your five best offensive linemen out there and start uh start pushing guys around yep absolutely should we move on to the rest of the picks start with edger and cooper in the second round let's do it so i was mad once again uh mad once again friday night as the second round started breaking and cooper jeans falls 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 and ultimately i believe gets taken before the Packers picked, if I'm not mistaken, the like, Eagles had the 40th overall pick, they and they picked Cooper him the, there. Yeah, like before Packers pick 41, traded traded back. Back. yeah. Which, who knows if he would have been the pick there? I would have sure hoped so, but part of me wishes they would have traded up because the price for trading up in this early second round was very cheap. It was like a fifth or sixth round pick. Like the Pats traded up, or I, I think whatever pick the Pats traded for or traded to get to move back, whatever it was, was very cheap. The Packers had multiple picks late in the late on day three that they could have traded to move up if they really wanted Cooper DeGene. And they could have obviously traded like 41 and that pick and moved up and got him, but clearly they didn't want to do that. 
Um, so to end up taking Texas A&M linebacker Adrian Cooper, who we talked about in our defensive uh, draft targets preview pod a few weeks ago. Um, this is for, uh, per ESPN stats and info. Quote, opposing ball carriers averaged just 2.5 yards when Cooper made the tackle last season, which bodes well for a Packers defense that ranks 28th against the run in 2023. Cooper also had eight sacks last season despite rushing the passer on only 23% of his snaps and his 4.51 40-yard dash at the combine was tied for fifth amongst all front seven defenders. Part of me just, like, worries that the college stats are coloring a different picture from what his pro, like, build is going to allow. Does that make sense? Like, a lot of the, the problems with... um. I should say the problems. A lot, a lot of like what the scouts were saying pre, uh, pre-draft was that it just looks like he got washed out on so many run plays, uh, not being able to shed tacklers and things like that. And that's where I worry if you'll be able to stop the run. And obviously that won't be really figured out for another couple of years. Like obviously it takes guys time to develop and takes guys time to learn um the run game in the nfl and how to defend it but that's like my main concern if he can help stop the run it'll be a a pick a a w pick for me um there's also this stat that kind of blew me away when i've been rounding up research and reactions to everything you know related to this draft uh per the athletic um Edgar Cooper is the drafts only player to lead his team in tackles, tackles for loss, sacks, and forced fumbles. And he did that on a team that had a top 10 defense, which is quite remarkable. And I think that kind of, I think you could easily land on the positive side of that, of this guy is kind of a jack of all trades, you know, equal, (laughs) equal distributor, of being i don't know he's a disruptor in very many ways at the same time i think it also boosts your point of it certainly colors his statistical profile and like if you're expecting him to be this kind of game breaker from the beginning you know it's a lot easier to do that when you're a fifth year senior than you are against nfl players that are as athletic or even more and it's not that Edwin cooper is athletic he's got a 9.11 ras score so the guy is hella fast and can do it in many ways right but the thing is is that these a lot of these players if you really look at them i mean themes continue with how goody picks and everything like that eight of these guys of the entire draft class were in the senior bowl yeah, you know I mean, like they're older prospects. They're, it's part of, and on top of that, it's guys that had an extra year of eligibility because of the COVID restriction. I think this is on. I think this is the last year where that fully applies. Like there might be some bleed over into next year, but this is like the last like big class that has that. Yeah, you know, yeah. In effect, and I think that too is very key to consider, like age curves, developmental curves. All that stuff. At the same time, I think when we had talked about Edwin Cooper and we talked about linebackers specifically, we both were, I don't remember, I remember myself not being as warm to him as, say, like Junior Colson. Or even, there was someone else that I think, I can't remember if we, Pay Wilson, yes. I can, actually, I don't even remember where he went. Uh, I think he went to the Steelers. Oh, that sounds like a Steelers pick. I'll look it up, but you keep talking. Um, but we kind of both felt we looked at other prospects of kind of filling that gap for the linebackers specifically because one, we felt Edron Cooper and Quay Walker were not necessarily just redundant, but they bring together similar skill sets, and we kind of you go. Yeah, Peyton Wilson went round three, pick thirty-five. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Interesting. Very Steelers pick. Anyway, we both were kind of like, oh, this guy, Pay Wilson could kind of play the Yang to Quay Walker's Yang, kind of thing like that. Or Junior Colson could do the same thing. 
that is kind of washed away from me. And ultimately, whether it's year one, whether it's year three, I think Edwin Cooper, there's no denying that he could be very disruptive. And the fact that he just has the speed to the ball, plays with a ferocity that, one, it's going to be nice to see a Packers linebacker that doesn't feel slow, not a shot to Devondre Campbell, not a shot to anybody before that, but like part of this youth movement that is going to continue is, and especially under Jeff Hathley is that they just want guys that can just speed to the ball. It's that is a lot different than doing a 30 yard dash to this invisible target. You know what I mean? Or whatever three cone shuttle drill, like this is the Brian branch effect of, you know, the guy just can play. That's and where I thought yes. that's, that's what I kind of was coming around to as well. And I think there, there are things that, you know, discipline has to get figured out. There's just kind of honing in on your just athletic gifts and your instincts and all that stuff. I think for me, the big thing from not just the Edron Cooper pick, but as we get into later in the draft, and especially as they go, more defensive ha- defense heavy is that these guys can just fly and that it would be huge for this defense that was just kind of it just felt like this shell yeah you know i mean instead of going they would grow outward from the play to prevent big plays which obviously was a contradiction because then they eventually gave up big plays now it's like no we want to bring it closer to the trenches the the line of scrimmage that kind of stuff of utilizing different players that bring different disruptions in different ways i think that to me it starts with the andrew cooper pick and it will trickle on down as we talk more into you know later on uh picks biggest thing with cooper is just make sure you can improve your tackling had uh 11 missed tackles in 2023 and 2022 just like just need him to wrap up that's all that's all i really need in life as the backers not to miss tackles um, from John Eric Sullivan, the Packers VP of personnel quote, the inside linebacker used to be a square, thick necked, come downhill, put your face on people in the a gap kind of guy. Now it's what we've got. It's Quay. It's Cooper. It's these guys that are six foot two. They're more linear. They're long. They can run. They can play in space and do the things you got to do to survive. Edger Cooper. That's one of the main things that attracted us uh, to him is, a sp- is his speed is different when he hits the gas and he's running things down. There's a wolf factor to that end quote. So yeah, like, Definitely plays fast, tends to overextend himself sometimes. If he can become more disciplined in his pursuit and not miss tackles and get a little too over his skis uh, in pursuit and go too fast to where a simple juke can kind of get him out of place, then so be it. I'll be ecstatic with the pick. I'm happy to be re- to be wrong on all of this analysis. And that's just kind of like where I'm at with the draft and things like that. Like, like I said, Cooper DeGene would have been there had they trade up to get him. He was there for them at 25. Same thing with Kool-Aid McKinstry early on in the second round. He was there for them to take. I was just, like, hoping that they'd get a secondary player because I was more... I shouldn't say... Linebacker and secondary were equal needs this offseason, I think. Linebacker was a lot more, I guess, showcasey. They really only had Quay. And so... I, I understand that. And McDuffie before someone interjects. I know Isaiah McDuffie and Eric Wilson exist, but right. Bay Walker is a full yeah. is a league ahead of them. Yeah. Not that they're like again, not to poo poo Isaiah McDuffie and and uh, Eric Wilson, but it's just it, it it's just different, right? And so ultimately, we'll see. This is all the draft stuff. We'll see, but um, I think they're lined up to do something good like i think i'm hoping they can just be consistent get their tackle tackling under control and be good to go start start stopping the run that's all i'm asking (laughs) yeah because i'm sick of getting dashed for 150 week in and week out against good uh against dynamic running backs to that point too um from that espn article by rob Domoski, which included a lot of interesting espn stats and info stuff uh, during Matt LeFleur's five seasons as a head coach, the Packers have allowed 4.7 yards per per rush, which is the worst mark in the NFL. Lovely. Unsurprisingly. Lovely. Unsurprisingly. Love to hear that. So, 
With that being said, should we move on to uh, one Javon Bullard? Let's go. Grab the Bullard by the horns. <laughs> that is... Oh, <laughs> I didn't even... <laughs> um, safety Javon Bullard out of Georgia. The uh, Had a pretty standout career there. He played three years... Uh, was primarily a two-year starter his sophomore and junior year. Uh, two-time NCAA champion with the Bulldogs, was named the defensive MVP uh, in the uh, college football playoff semifinal against Ohio State, as well as the MVP um, in the national title game as well, where he earned, where he had two interceptions and a fumble recovery despite leaving early um, in that game. So... Definitely a guy that can play. This feels a lot like the Brian Branch uh, argument where, like, you see a guy that has all this experience in a in a program that has produced so many pro players, and you wonder why he's he had to he had to be wait he had to wait until the third round to be drafted. I'm sorry, the second round to be drafted. The late second round at that. Um, but uh, Trevor, is it, is it Sakima? I'll say Sakima. I'm not going to, I don't know how to pronounce that man's name. It's, a, it's in the middle for, in the middle for me. A versatile chess piece that is, uh, increased played all over the field and, uh, it played all over the field in a pro ready scheme. My apologies. This is from, uh, Trevor quote. He's one of four power five players who earned the 80 plus grades in PFF coverage and run defense grades from the slot over the past two years. His versatility makes the Packers secondary substantially better. I saw a few different things from, um, whether it was PFF or uh, Brugler, about how he plays better in the slot than he does safety. And they made that sort of like as a knock against him because he is a safety. And I think for, for the Packers, that's just like the best thing for them, right? They just signed Xavier McKinney in the offseason, like a star safety who they can play, um, like not cover one, but just play one deep safety yeah. and disguise Bullard as coming in or as like a second safety deep and then have him play in the slot or um, have some some pass rushing too. I think he had, uh, I had it somewhere. He had a few sacks in, in 2022. He had four pressures and three sacks in 2022. And... Um, not so many in 2023, but at the cost of he was playing a lot more deep safety in 2023 versus 2022. Um, I'm trying to see if I don't, yeah, I don't have the exact, um, the numbers up for his coverage deep versus safety. Actually, I might. I can give me a hot second. Nope, this doesn't want to load. Regardless, Javon Bullard played a lot of slot his sophomore year and a lot of safety his um his his junior year like deep safety now i got the stats pulled up in 2022 he played 386 slot snaps versus 98 in 2023 in uh 2023 he played 322 free safety snaps and nine slot snaps so like a stark contrast in how Georgia used him as a as a player from his sophomore season to his uh to his junior season but I think that's a huge plus for the Packers. They they like talked about how much they needed a slot corner. We talked about how much they needed a slot corner going into free agency and they didn't really get anybody for that. And so now I know that I think besides Keyshawn besides Keyshawn, right? But I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Xavier McKinney played some played some slot and so now they can kind of mix up who's deep, who's in the slot. Um, for their looks that way and rotate out guys who are playing in this lot. Like, I think that's going to be a, a good, I think this is a really good pick for the Packers, frankly. 8.25 RES and uh, was the fourth Georgia defensive player to be drafted by the Packers in the last three drafts. Quay, excuse me. Um, why am I blanking on his name? He's my guy. De- uh, Devontae Wyatt and uh, Eric Stokes were the other three. I may have an answer to a question that I will ask later as we wrap the pod. Okay. You'll, you'll, we'll close that loop. All right. But to me, this might be the most 
interesting and probably tips their hand the most of how they want to play defensively, at least in the backside. Because it's a lot of things to like, okay, let's, this is how Jeff Hathaway wants to play. You know, things that may go over my head of like, we want, you know, X zero and Y, uh, I heart N Y or whatever, whatever code that they. <laughs> I heart N Y. Are you a t-shirt? Whatever terminology that they're going to use for their defensive coverage. Spider Y2 banana. Come on. Exactly. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is having a guy like Javon Bullard um, helps masquerade this defense in a lot of different ways. It's about versatility. Whereas under Joe Barry, yes, we know what that is, what, what that means, what that configures, and how the Packers played. It just felt like room temperature milk. You know what I mean? Just like that, just not great. <laughs> um, to me, I think if you want to be this disruptive team, and I'm just going to keep using that word because I think that is the biggest theme with the defense, or that sincerely has to improve because it was just milk toast last year, especially is that you have guys that you can... Room put, temp milk toast. Room, room temp milk toast, exactly. You have guys that can, you can put all over the field that can make plays, that can just jam up offenses. You don't have Tommy DeVito running through your freaking defense. Like, I won't get back into that. That was months ago. But to me, I think Javon Bouillard... Bullard. God. I was going to say. Is, <laughs> I know. I did both. I know. Um, To me, he just feels very pro-ready. He clearly is a gamer. It's stupid, but like it's seeing guys play on the biggest stages of college football and showing out like he did. I know it ended an injury, but being, the, being named the defensive MVP when, when your t- team – slaughters TCU 65 to seven kind of means something to me, I would say. Um, I just think, you know, I know he was not the first safety taken in this class. Uh, that distinction went to Tyler Newbin at number 47 overall to the Giants. We just knew the importance of bringing in a safety. And obviously the Packers brought in three safeties in the draft. So it was that big of a need to shore up and just add more bodies to it. But I think Javon Bullard, Uh, I'm going to keep just like kind of stepping. Um, I think he might have the biggest impact right away. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Uh, Doesn't miss a lot of tackles. Only seven missed tackles last year compared to five the year before. Um, Post draft. uh, My apologies. This is from Dane Brugler uh, from the Beast, obviously. Again, shout out Dane Brugler. Overall, uh, Bullard doesn't have ideal size or length, but he is ultra instinctive and makes his presence felt at all three levels of the field. His skill set fits best as a hybrid nickel defender who can handle box duties, box duties, disguise his intentions, and drop into space. Like, I think that sort of outline, going back to last year, just kind of explains our thoughts on Brian Branch. We're talked out of him because of... Um, the lack of tackling ability, but knew how to play and played fast. And then obviously had quite the impact for the Lions this year when he was on the field. Um, This is Bullard on draft night. Quote, I don't think I know I can play all three positions in the secondary. Whatever you need me to play, I feel like I proved myself. I've proved my versatility throughout this process. Being able to cover slot guys and being able to cover tight ends and being able to get down the box and get down and dirty with your running backs, things like that. So I feel like I can play all over. He is only 5'11". 195 so he will have trouble kind of guarding some of the bigger tight ends in the league your travis kelsey's your darren wallers who i saw was rooming or uh rooming retirement but like mark andrews pick a big tj hawkinson in um in division is a big one same thing with uh sam laporta like he'll have trouble guarding those guys if asked to i'd imagine they might ask mckinney to do that because i'm not mistaken i think mckinney's a little taller than that but um regardless of it all if you can just play be a surefire tackler and 
like interrupt passes that's just fine and as a defensive um scheme as well he had looks like seven forced incompletions last year which is pretty good no touchdowns um allowed had two interceptions last year so by all means go for it i'm i'm all about it right exactly should we move on to uh marshawn lloyd running back let's do it go for it um number 88th overall pick i don't think Oh, did I, I say his, did I say that his pick wrong, Bullards? I did. What did you say? I said he was picked in the third round. Did I? Maybe I didn't. I don't know. Sorry. I, I honestly can't remember. If I did, he was picked in the late second, not the late third. Um, Lloyd is very intriguing. That that is a wonderful, wonderful way to put it for his sake. <laughs> <laughs> what i think that's a good thing go for it. i'll i'll have we'll talk about them go go on with your explanation okay well i'm just gonna say that the things that stood out to me is very be able to generate explosive plays uh only season at usc 116 carries 820 yards rushing yards 7.1 yards per carry nine rushing tds 13 receptions on two for 232 yards I think you should uh, so, clarify his only season at the University of South Carolina or of, of Southern California. Yes, his only season at Southern California. Uh, 13 receptions, 232 receiving yards, 17.8 yards per catch, no receiving touchdowns. Um, you mentioned in your notes, obviously, being the running back in an offense that featured the number one overall pick, um, you're not going to be the feature star. Yeah, he was the running back behind Caleb Williams. But I thought I thought for a USC team that clearly uh, underwhelmed, yeah, by a lot of standards, especially when again that same team had the number one overall pick under center. Um, I thought Marshawn Lloyd did a lot of favors for him, right? I mean, this is not this was not a strong running back class. Uh, Dane Brugler viewed him as the fifth uh, running back in his estimation. Um, first running back went off the board, I believe, at that Jonathan Brooks. It was. It was in the second round a little bit. Yes, Jonathan Brooks went... I think to the Jaguars. 46th. He went to the Panthers. Panthers. 46th to the Panthers, and then it was um, Trey Benson to the Cardinals at 66. Yep. Then Marshawn Lloyd. Yep. Or, sorry, then Blake Corum to the Rams, then yep. Marshawn Lloyd. Yep. Um. Yeah, this is not a deep running back class. It was obviously not one that was loaded at the top even, um, especially with a lot of offensive players getting taken off the board at the beginning of it. I think for me, what stands out, big playability, that you know, projects that you can be of use to start right away, even if, say, which has been – labeled or he has been labeled as being a very poor bat pass blocker that is going to be a no-no under Matt LaFleur um but I just think the ways that he can just impact from day one whether it's as a kick returner you know uh special teamers in that way or say third down big play that they need a big play and it's a passing set and you see Marshawn Lloyd try to extend plays that way I don't know it's obviously more of a future pick that they they went all in on Josh Jacobs, but only so far as Gary team his first year. And I think it for me, he's more exciting than say AJ Dillon and gives more competition to a guy like Emmanuel Wilson to force that he keeps keeping up his development so he sticks with the team. You're right. So all of that being said, yes. He is one of the biggest, I think, boomer bust players in this draft. He is, you watch him run on really good plays, and it's dazzling. Yeah. Cutting all over, making guys miss, just stupidly fast speed. Like, he is really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. But then, you look at some of the other not highlight plays. He fumbled eight times in 32 games. Uh, over the course of his college career at a rate of once every 36 touches at the college level that's really bad 
like, if you think what, a heavy load for a running back was what, 20 carries last year for Aaron Jones? Yeah. Right? What, so at that rate that he fumbled the college once every two games, that's <laughs> really bad. There was a play against uh, UCLA where it encapsulated uh, Marshawn Lloyd as a running back where he jumped outside of his of his hole that he was supposed to hit, made yeah. like two guys miss, was almost ready to make a third guy miss, fumbled the ball, scoop and score for UCLA for a touchdown. Like, he is a dazzling player. He uh, only hit the hole he was that was like opened for him by Lyman 57% of the time, which is pretty low on runs. He likes to bounce it outside a whole lot, which is just not feasible in today's NFL. Like You just can't become a, a jump back that's always trying to bust it outside rather than hitting your holes up the middle or things like that. But on the other side, he had the eighth highest missed tackle rate for running backs across all of college football. And so uh, a couple of the the things that I saw from like just people analyzing players on YouTube and things like that were they call them DeAndre Swift. Like all the skills, but just not consistent. And I think that might make me want to pull my hair out. It's just a matter, like, matter of the fact of can they develop them to be able to hold on to the ball better. I'm of the opinion that if you've had fumble problems, you're not going to fix fumble problems. Like it's really hard like think about aj Dillon, right came out of college having never lost a fumble in college and then we didn't really see aj Dillon ever fumble in the nfl as well aaron jones didn't have fumble problems but he definitely put the ball on the ground more often than you'd like to see uh happen that's not me like taking a dig at form now former packer aaron jones it's just true like it goes I, back to like about green that was the biggest reason why he wasn't a starter right he goes to green bay Amazing career in Green Bay. Amazing. He's a team's leading wrestler, for God's sake. Yep. He had a fumbling problem. Yep. And you have to learn. If you if the good outweighs the bad, you live with it. Yep. When you're a player like Marshawn Lloyd, who he's hoping to squeak by A.J. Dillon to be the, the second string back by when it's all said and done. Yeah. You have to shore up those things, and that's a big... I. I pretty big thing. I, I don't think he beats out AJ Dillon for any significant time this year. I think Josh Jacobs and Marshawn Lloyd are too too similar of backs to the point of like they aren't going to do a, a change of pace guy like Marshawn Lloyd as their second uh, string running back. Does that make sense? Like, I think Josh Jacobs can run north south and can run outside. I don't think they're. They'll be a. I think they'll treat Marshawn Lloyd a lot like Patrick Taylor to begin with. Yeah, not in the pass blocking I, stuff because he can't pass block that well, but in like usage rate, if that makes sense. I think that. Um. I think your analogy of AJ Dillon as the the apt one because it's like. We talked ourselves into he's gonna take this leap. He's gonna take this leap. He's got. It's not that he was a complete back because he wasn't. He's more of like this guy fits the ethos of being the the change up. You know what I mean? And for lo- what he lacked in burst and kind of quick twitchy speed and all that stuff, he made up for him like playing a more power run game. Marshawn Lloyd clearly has everything that you want it's just a matter of putting that all together meeting in the middle and kind of honing your abilities i think for aj dylan it's it's very much like make the best of what you've been given kind of thing whereas marshall lloyd it, that applies to him too but it's clear that like this the in-between has to get sharpened a little bit more if that makes sense yep totally get it uh from dame brugler uh, he had a third round grade on um, Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, fifth running back in his class, quote, overall, Lloyd doesn't have the high profile of a high volume back, but he can spark an NFL offense with his mix of patience, burst, and promise as a pass catcher. His tape gives me flashbacks of a thicker version of Duke Johnson when he's coming out of Miami. I I think he has promise as a, as a end quote, obviously. I think he has, like, potentials as a pass catcher. Um, this is the getting way into the weeds for what I've done for other, like, draft things, but 
has like really small hands. He has like 14th percentile of running back like size hands, which like say what you will. I'm not going to go and act like I'm a pro scout looking at size of hands and how it relates to them. their ability to actually catch the ball kind of thing, but worth noting. Um, this is from Lloyd himself. Quote, I'm the best running back in the draft for sure. I think Green Bay got the best running back in the draft because they think the exact same. I'm super confident with that. I think Daniel Jeremiah, that's going that's going to come up in the next few years, exactly what he says. I definitely do feel like he's telling the truth on that part. Wish I had his... <laughs> His context of what he said, but regardless. Um, anything else on Marshawn Lloyd? I think we'll know kind of what he is by I think by the end of the year. I'm not sure he's really? a I don't think he's like a marinate and pop kind of guy. Does that make sense? Like Does that make sense or no? You think he like says all steak? Is that was that what you mean? I think we'll see him enough in packages from the floor to know if like he's got it or if he doesn't have it. Interesting. Yeah. In a very, very, very similar way to Mari Rogers. Does that make sense? Where he gets a lot of usage and what he does with his usage isn't either good or bad. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, that's a name that will raise eyebrows around the I know. Cards. I know. Um, all right. Moving on. Tyron <laughs> Hopper, linebacker out of Missouri. In 2023, he had 55 tackles, 30th, six of which were solo, six tackles for a loss, three sacks, three PBUs, was named second team all SEC. He spent his uh, three, first three seasons at Florida and transferred to Missouri for his final two. He is an older player. He began his college career in 2013 as a redshirt freshman. He just turned 23, so going a bit off of the Packers' typical like the draft young guys thing. Um, led, tack- led Missouri in tackles for a loss in 2022. Uh, from PFF, uh, he was the 191st ranked player and 13th ranked linebacker, quote, Hopper is more athletic than his measurables suggest. His athleticism does provide upside for him to find field find the field early on in special teams, and he can contribute on defense if he develops. He was excellent as a pass rusher, pass rusher recording 49 pressures since 2022, and showed promise in coverage by allowing just one touchdown in his career uh, while in coverage. I watched a bit of his um of his tape last night, and I think he's got some serious potential to be sort of like a, a disruptor in, uh, for, for the Packers as a linebacker. He had a much better season in 2022 than he did in 2023. I think that might have been just the fact that I don't think Missouri was that good this past year. Um, but I'm trying to see. Majority played in the box. He had, like I said, just one touchdown allowed this year. I think that was the only touchdown he allowed in coverage in his, in his career. Um, I wish I had his second year. Oh, yeah, I do here. His 2022 um, stats had four sacks in 2022 compared to three in 2023. Had one interception last year, had none this year. His uh, passer rating this past year, uh, when people threw at him, was 103.6 for 21 uh, receptions on 30 targets for 231 yards. Last year, is 18 receptions on 26 targets for 144 yards. That uh, NFL ra- passer rating last year was 66.8, so much better. I think if you can get the 2022 version of Tyron Hopper, this is an absolute home run swing of a pick. He flies to the ball and, and run uh, on runs. I think he's he's quite fast <laughs> for what it's worth. He just like looks like he, he plays fast, so I'm uh, I'm about it. I think this was like their biggest reach of uh the draft per like consensus where guys are getting picked but i see the vision in in this pick with for, uh, for the packers taron hopper has the distinction of being named the josiah deguara value pick oh, of this year. like in a bad way or a good way well in terms of here's a guy 
not to do a full sim. Here's a guy. Um, here's a guy that everybody that follows draft cycles pegged him as a fifth rounder at best. Yeah, you know I mean like day three pick pick. Got and it. then Packers take him ninety one. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get and that. And I think part of it is certainly a reach based on what you see or based on who else is on the board and stuff like that. Part of it is I I do think need played a factor into it. I mean Brian Gudekun's um comments kind of just throughout the offseason has been about the really thin linebacker. Um, it's clear that Edron Cooper was not going to be the only one guy that they were going to take at linebacker to fill that room. Especially going to a different scheme where they're going more for three. Um, I think... I, I don't know. I... I that's where it's hard to kind of d- divorce yourself from. This is what I see. This is what he brings to the table. But this is what people think that have watched him, evaluated him over time. And he's transferred. He's gone to different scenery, you know, or different environments to play. How does that differ from what he brings to the table? That's where it's like this big unknown of, do you trust the kind of neutral evaluators? Or do you trust the uh, this is what we feel best for our team and it's made through the focus of green bay rather than just this is a big board this is how we view of it and everything like that that's where i think it's really interesting with when something like this happens because the difference of, of opinion is so great so great and there's actually a good stat of um what's his name arif hassan he has a subset called wide left football where he goes through the consensus draft boards and ranks players by where they were consensus like picks and his Tyron Hopper uh, pick was minus 62 right. from where he was actually taken to where he was a consensus. Right. That actually wasn't the highest negative value pick um, that went was to that Jacob Lloyd? Monk. Oh, okay. Well, no, it went to Jacob Monk. Um, Michael Pratt, by the way, on uh, the other hand, was plus 118, where people felt like he was going to go be taken a lot earlier than what he was, um, for what's that, for what it, that is worth. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that's where it gets really interesting to kind of see how that plays out. And by and large, I, I do expect more special teams usage for Hopper, but Packers, they need more help at the linebacker position. Mm-hmm. And different ways to utilize linebackers, so he's definitely going to get some run, you know, even if it's for kind of spelling other guys yeah. during the, his rookie season. No, absolutely, I, I I agree with you there. Um, Goody had to say this about Hopper: "quote He's really physical. He can run, but his stopping power when he takes on blockers is pretty impressive. Very serious-minded guy. I think he really helped change that defense. The Missouri def- defense this year was excellent. So I'm about it. I think he's going to be." better than we anticipate this is just for my one evening of highlight watching so um all right jordan should we blast through the rest of these picks quick and then uh get in get into some grades for these guys yeah let's do do you want to do like more kind of overall impressions day three of how many picks one two five three, four, six five, six yeah so basically, the latter half of the draft from the from Green Bay's perspective, yeah. a lot of movement, but they ultimately picked as many picks as they were had going into the night. Yep. So they started uh, day three off with drafting a senior out of uh, not a senior, I'm sorry, safety out of uh, Oregon, Evan Williams, uh, at pick 111. Followed that up with uh, Jacob Monk, the aforementioned Jacob Monk out of Duke on the offensive line. Went back to safety at pick 169 for uh, Keaton Aladapo out of Oregon State. Then went back to the line with Travis Glover out of Georgia State. Um, then, like you had said, Michael Pratt at 245 and cornerback Kalen King as a cornerback um, at pick 255. So, a lot of these guys are like 
I guess, I don't want to say replacement level players, but a lot of them were graded out, like, just okay on, on PFF. But say what you will about that for these kind of players and how, how deep they are for going in for, I can't remember how many college football teams there are, but there's a lot of them. So, regardless of all that. Um, I think the biggest thing was a lot of these are are versatile guys. And we have to talk about the biggest oddity out of the draft that uh, offensive lineman Jacob Monk is a, allergic to cold water. The biggest revelation, I looked more into this because I'm a weirdo and had to understand what this meant because, you know, I know David Bakhtiari has strong opinions on room temperature water. Um, what? I, didn't know I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise that he has a strong opinion about anything. You'd be correct. Uh, according to this Wikipedia article on Jacob Monk, it was during college that Monk learned that he had an incredibly rare, albeit mild, allergy. Cold uticaria, which is an allergy to cold water. For Monk, this manifests as breaking out in hives when he is submerged in an ice bath. That's wild. That's crazy. That's crazy. I am. He said that some... they, they said that it, like all the other like questions you think you would have for talking about a guy with allergic who has an allergy to cold water, pretty much apply. He like snow doesn't bother him. Anything else? Like I think it's just long exposure to cold water. Um, let's, let's look at this. Cause I did see a lot of it on Twitter where he like actually explained like the issues. Yeah. Apparently according to the Mayo Clinic, it's a skin reaction to cold that appears within minutes after cold exposure. Um, there's minor reactions. I worry what the severe reactions would be. Um, but obviously playing in a city that is notorious for being a cold weather city yeah, would you know, bring up these questions. Right, exactly. Um, you want to go through a couple of the the grades that they got from from analysts, things like that. Yes, the overall. I would say a lot of the overall grading of the classes was positive, if not overwhelmingly. Mm-hmm. Like I feel there's a lot of B's. Let's go, Mel Kiper from ESPN graded a B. Dame Brugler ranked the Packers class 21 out of 32. Um, Trevor Sikama from PFF gave it a B plus. Chad Reuter of NFL.com gave it a B. Danny Kelly of the, of the Ringer was uh, more just kind of meh. Gave them a C. Well, he tried to um, trade picks from, from a team to our team when they first didn't have picks, so I'm not really trusting his opinion, frankly. I do, because I think he's actually... I, I like his draft analysis at least um i do think it's my soapbox i do think it is more of i think though from an outsider's perspective if you're looking at a team that their biggest skill player that they their only skill player really that they took in the draft was marshawn lloyd who doesn't project to be a day one starter i think that's an interesting like thing to think about as well like yes we'll get into it but yeah and it's a lot of servicing what's already there you know what i mean that that was the biggest thing that we have been hitting on going into this draft class of like the heavy lifting is already in place that doesn't mean that it's going to change in the future because god knows football means players get hurt players don't necessarily pan out the way that they do or sustain long, long careers because of injuries or whatever but for what the Packers have built, they really, they really feel highly on what they have right now, in terms of obviously a quarterback. But with their wide receiver room making a big splash with J- Josh Jacobs, with um, their pair of tight ends that flashed in their own regard over the course of the last year, it this is a very I can understand the feeling of being more tepid about it or. If you're really bullish on, hey, look at the defensive players that they added. They they doubled or even tripled up on positions, knowing that 
one, they need more depth of those positions. Two, not everybody's going to pan out in the same way as you know you value your own initial dra- draft grades. Um, I can understand the kind of like you know the tepid uh, response to it, or the more like this is a good draft class, but it's not like an overwhelming you know great draft class like the bears uh, their big name picks are like the sexiest picks of you know it's a quarterback at number one it's a wide receiver that you hope to be your franchise wide receiver at number nine like that just like oozes like i want to talk about like how these how this works how they want to play and everything like that whereas it's fitting guys that can you know fitting roles into whatever position they're going to be going into going into Green Bay. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. Um I guess going into like I guess themes from the draft. Start we'll start with the point you just made about how they did, they only took one uh specialist player in in Marshawn Lloyd. There was a lot of talk that the, like a lot of talk I guess like uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word basically projection that the the Packers would would take a receiver at some point in this draft because all of their receivers are so young like Christian Watson Romeo Dobbs are going to year three Jaden Reed Dante Wicks uh and Malik Heath are all going into year two and same thing with uh Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft and they obviously they can't sign re-sign all seven of those guys when they come up right like that just isn't how mm. the, their cap is gonna shake out and so drafting a receiver just to have one in the in the pen essentially for one those contracts come due is always a good idea i think they're fine as it is right now like i think they'll be able to resign a bunch of those guys when their contracts come up i do think that colors the the draft for next year quite quite heavily same thing with not taking any interior defensive linemen in this draft after taking two last year like they have Carl Brooks and Colby Wooden, who in their own right performed quite well last year, but then you still have Devontae Wyatt, whose projection as an NFL starter is a little bit tenuous, and then the upcoming Kenny Clark um, contract is going to be massive from whoever he gets it from. Like, yeah. There's a lot of interior defensive linemen that he's better than getting paid a lot more than he's getting paid now. And so, how that shakes out, it will definitely color how they draft next year. And I think those are the two biggest things, as well as just, again, looking at how much they invested into their positions of need this year. Um, 811 picks that the Packers made played in the Senior Bowl this year. And they doubled up and tripled up on multiple positions, including linebacker, safety, and offensive line. Like, obviously there's multiple positions on, on the offensive line, but a lot of the linemen they drafted are versatile across the line. Like, even, like, Jacob Monk has the opportunity to play center if... Um, they want to move on from the Josh Myers experiment or how we want to do it. But I think they drafted what three linemen, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah uh, Morgan, Jordan, Monk, Morgan, Monk, Glover. Monk, and Glover. They drafted uh, three safeties in uh, Bullard, Evan Williams and Keith and Oladapo. Like they're taking swings on guys because they know that they're, these players are at positions of, positions of need over the next few years. Same thing at linebacker. They took two linebackers. And I'm not always sure drafting for positions of need is like the best way to draft. We'll see how like this class shakes out. But I think this is Goody and company trying to fix their very obvious gaping holes in their defense with at linebacker and safety just to figure find a guy that works, right? If they can find one one of these guys to pop, it's a successful draft uh, at each, yeah. at each each position. Like if Jordan Morgan is good, and Glover and Monk are not, that's fine. If either Cooper or Hopper are good and the other one is not, that's fine. If Bullard, uh, Williams or Odapo, if one of them pop next to McKinney, great even better kind of thing. Like that's just how I see this as a positive with the understanding that no edge rusher uh, taken in this draft, no interior defensive lineman cornerback was the third to last pick. 
and no receiver. Like I think that'll be a, a huge look into what they do, what they do next year, and what they're going to prioritize in the draft and in free agency. I think the biggest thing, especially coming out of a draft class last year, where we talked about it multiple times throughout the year, especially as they're making their run to the playoffs and then beating the Cowboys, is that you look at going from Lucas Van Ness to, you know, let's just say Anthony Johnson Jr. because Lou Nichols and Grant DeBose didn't make the team. Or Grant DeBose made the team and they got hurt. Yeah. Um, everybody had equal opportunity. Outside of Sean Clifford, they had equal opportunity to make plays, make flashes, yada, yada, yada. And I think we kind of look at it as like, look at the strength of the this draft class. You know what I mean? Of this is a really well-balanced draft class that immediately showed flashes, some more than others. I think that's you... I think that's colored by the fact that they didn't do anything in free agency because they couldn't. Why? Well, because they couldn't. Yes. Yeah. Right. I don't think there was outside of like the guys we already like talked about. I don't think like don't get me wrong. They knocked the, that draft out of the park last year, but. Yes a lot because of opportunity that yes. was just that they just had they just had to play uh yeah anthony johnson jr had to play at some point like carrington valentine had to play, had to play. <laughs> like and that's I good think, i think the biggest difference is that i don't i think when we think about this draft class in like five years like when the first all everybody will be off the board or like the next you know, contract will set in. Yep. Is that not a lot? Not a lot of guys will stick. But Out the of guys this draft? that do stick, yeah, in Green Bay will be the guys that at pre- premium positions or like we're talking about them starters for long term. Yeah. Value. Yeah. You know what I mean, yeah, I can and see that, that. That is a risky. That's a risky play, especially when you're doubling and tripling up on positions. But based on where they have the biggest glaring needs, is that they had room to do that. Yeah, they didn't you need know. to take a guy at receiver because the receiver room is full as that, as it are as, as full as it already is. They didn't need to take an edge rusher because that one's full as well. I think they could have taken an edge rusher because right now you're sitting with Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, Lucas Van Ness, Brenton Cox Jr., and Kingsley Anibare, who didn't have ACL surgery this year. So that was the thing that we were gonna. I, I that know was I, the biggest thing that came out of the draft. Yeah, the Heat did tear his ACL. But it wasn't as bad as they thought. He didn't get surgery for it. He's not going to miss the entire season. So they're bullish that he could play. Yeah. But I think it's not taking an edge rusher. I th- I don't think you'd call it a criticism. I just think that running with five, if you're including Brenton Cox Jr. in this scenario, which I think you have to considering Enigbar is not going to start. He's on the 53. Well, that and the fact that yeah, exactly. They put him on the 53-man last roster last year. He made the team. Didn't play a whole lot, but he's still on the team as an undrafted free agent. But then yeah. now with Enigbari's injury, you have to assume they're going to run four a game, and he's probably going to be in there um, a few times early on in the season while uh, Enigbari comes back. So, But yeah, I don't think you can call it a criticism, criticism, criticism Excuse me, that they didn't take an edge rusher, but worth monitoring is, I guess the vibe there. All right, Jordan. looks like we have some quick questions slash superlatives you want to go for. Are you, are you ready? I am ready. I haven't looked at them. I just saw the, the header. Which pick will make the most starts next season? Starts? Um, I'm trying to think how they would line up their defense. It goes... Th- to a 4-3 now, right? That's what Hathaway runs as 4-3. Yeah. Um, probably Cooper, I, I think is where I am. Because I, I think Jordan Morgan is also a contender for this, but I would be remiss to just hand him that job over Rasheed Walker right away. That's kind of where I am with, I am with that. I guess the more 
that the better way to phrase that is that who sees the most snaps? I think Jordan Morgan sees the most snaps. Really? I would have th- thought you'd still stick to Edwin Cooper. Then again, you would get a downsize in passing plays. Yeah. And he might not be a three down linebacker just yet. Right. I think it's going to be close. I definitely could. It's It definitely could still be Edgar Cooper. I also just think that, like, if they invested a first round pick in Jordan Morgan, they're probably going to find a place to play him. I think so too. But I think, like, starts. I think it's Edger Cooper because I think they'll just start. Let's go snaps. I like snaps better than starts. That snaps is the, the point of what I was trying to make. Okay, then probably Jordan Morgan. Jordan Morgan. Yeah. Plus, I think they'll be uh, out there I... longer because the offense is good. There we go. Um, on that same kind of wavelength, which pick will have the biggest impact as a rookie next season? So think of more of like they're not just out on the field, but they're making plays. It's a little tougher to do when, you know, three offensive linemen, three safeties, two linebackers. Yeah. Um, That one's hard, too. I'm between Bullard and Morgan. I think, I think I'm going to go spicy and just say Bullard. I don't think that's spicy. I think that's the right answer. I think next to McKinney, he has an opportunity to like really be disguised in the things that they're doing and have a huge impact on the team. But I also think that he also could just be overshadowed by McKinney too. Yeah. Let's go Buller just to be fun. But I think realistically, like biggest impact. I mean, it still has to be Jordan Morgan, right? But I think it definitely could be Bullard, depending on how how well the secondary looks under Halfley. Like if they if they look if it, like starkly if it different, yeah, I think it'll be in part because of McKinney, Bullard, Halfley's new scheme, and just the overall um, execution by Jair and Carrington Valentine. Infusion. Yep, exactly, exactly. That's that's the biggest thing. Yep. Um, which pick will make a D- Dontavian Wicks like impact? As in, which pick will we think will be the breakout sophomore next year? So kind of buzzy. You mean doesn't necessarily get a lot of snaps, but when he is out there, hold on, he's making flashes. Oh, so the guy that, so the the guy out of this class that we think going into twenty twenty five season is ready for the breakout. Yeah, he's a grower, not a shower. Jesus Christ. Um, this is gonna be. A bit in the weeds. I think it's going to be Kalen King. I. This is why I made this question. Yeah. Um, this is why I made this question. Third to last pick in the draft, but Jaden Reed tweeted when he was drafted that he's not a seventh round pick, and Jaden Reed went against Kalen King in college. That's true. Like, yeah. I'm going to take Jaden Reed's he word went for against it him during King's good year. Right. Like, I'm going to take his yeah. word for it that if he went against him and was like, okay, that guy can play, I'm going to go with him. Um, he, Kalen King notably watched a lot of Charles Woodson's tape uh, growing up and developing as a player in high school and college. So, if you're taken after Charles Woodson, you probably got some good instincts. I'm excited to see how he plays. I hope they keep him on. I mean, he's got to make the 50-30 first. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. I, I I just think, to me, there was some quote that I was trying to find that Bill Belichick said, but he basically said, like, this guy is not a seventh-round pick. You know, in his estimation, it was a lot higher than what, you know, bad year and all that stuff. And a bad year to come out of the draft, clearly. Or come, yeah, you know what I mean. But when it came to Wicks, it was like, this guy had a really good year of tape. Yeah, it didn't time it right to when he was turning pro. But still, you look at what he, his body of work and not just the year that he turns pro. And I think that still means something. I mean, not all these guys are going to time it the right way. Sometimes you take an early leave 
and or jump to the NFL or whatever league that they're playing and it doesn't work out like or the vice versa is that you run out the string and your last year as a senior is just terrible or not as good as everybody thought it was I think to me if the talent is there and it shows through a, a year's worth of work that does mean something rather than just game to game or whatever so he was the entire reason why I made this question and that's why I just wanted to highlight on other guys. Jacob Monk was another guy that Dane Brugler picked out um, in his estimation of like, he just could serve a valuable role of that. He plays a lot of positions, super athletic. His RES score is like off the charts and stuff like that. That's going to be very useful to an offensive line that didn't have a lot of depth behind a starting five and was quite lumbering when you think of like Royce Newman just struggling to <laughs> right so i think that's that's a note as well yeah is that it are you ready yeah i got one more okay we're gonna go negative oh god <laughs> which pick will make the least impact while in green bay i think there's an answer that we hope it will be yeah i think what we hope it will be and what it will be is the same answer it's michael pratt yes. the qb from tulane like you don't want to say anything bad about the guy. It's not his fault he got drafted to a team with a quarterback, but seventh round quarterback behind a quarterback set to get a pretty large extension in the second year backup who played pretty well in the preseason last year. Like I just I just don't think there's a a reality where Michael Pratt sees anything close to a to the season this year. Unless for some reason Sean Clifford would get hurt, knock on wood. Um he might, I will say, the competition for number two might be interesting. But long term, if we see Michael Pratt out there, I don't think we're talking about him as a Brock Purdy. I think we're talking about Jordan Love is hurt, and that sucks. And the yeah. next pod that we might talk about is Jordan Love getting his extension, which he would be eligible for by the time not all people are listening to this, but by and large is coming very soon so i think it's the end of the week it is like may 2nd or something like that i thought it was it's, for some reason in my brain it's the third or the sixth it's a year from when he signed his last extension which is which is after the draft yes because that's it's when they did it was the day that fifth years were announced last year yes so but that's the first day you can sign it doesn't mean it will be signed that day it should be they've been talking about it but that doesn't mean we get that news that day kind of thing you signed it on may 2nd yeah so i think may, may 3rd is the first day you can sign it yep sign the extension that is so all right jordan anything else on this 2024 class of packers rookies i think there's a lot to be whelmed by if that makes sense. Yep. I think they service what they needed to get done and what roster holes that were very prominent. Uh, those were fulfilled and hopefully moving forward, we talk about these guys popping in a way that continues all the goodwill that they have built in terms of continuing that draft and develop re reputation, stuff like that. Like the benefit of the doubt of, how the Green Bay Packers build their teams mm -hmm. was reinforced when they ushered in this new era. And to continue that with a team that's clearly on the rise and wants to make considerable noise next year, having one or two of these guys pop right away and then sustain that over you know, the next five, hopefully, decade would be critical and huge. Also, I think we got... Uh validated as a fan base that the the falcons directly talk pointed out the packers way of drafting quarterbacks as the way that they want to build their team which was cool even though which is very cool even even though that panic pick is insane um already anything else Jordan, or should we wrap up no i think i think we're i think we're all good perfect all right folks Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to check out all things Eurostep Podcast Network at gspn.info. Um, 
go subscribe to all of our Twitter accounts over there at New Mac is known at Jordan Tresky on Twitter. Um, go follow all the other pods cruising for a bruising, which is talking all things Brewers after the Brewers just dropped uh, two or three from to the Yankees. Um, with Adam and Andrew, go talk, go listen to that along with their pod. Uh, Capture and Celluloid, that just, I think their latest uh, episode was on Civil War, the new A24 movie. And they said on uh, their next episode, it's going to be on Challengers, the Zendaya chal- uh, tennis movie that has people feel some type of way, apparently. And then uh, be sure to... Dirty Love? Sure. Something like that. I, 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 yep. I've actually never heard of this movie. It's Oh, I don't know how you've missed this. They've had... They've had a lot of marketing. I'll put it that way. Interesting. Uh, and be sure to check out all things Bucks as we spiral into the abyss of doom going into Tuesday night, game five at Pfizer with probably no Dan, probably no Giannis. So Eurostep boys, Ty and Rohan have you covered there. And so does Jordan Adam on one and six. So go check out all the pods. Be sure to subscribe, join the discord uh, and stay tuned for some big and exciting things coming up very, very soon. So, Thank you, everyone, for listening. And Jordan, thank you. Thank you.